backstage in the green room, I learned uh, a few fun facts about, about the Surgeon General um, that I just thought I would pass on, you know. Um, so apparently his uniforms cost $4,000, um, $125 of which was reimbursed to him by the federal government. <laughs> and I'm grateful for every penny that was reimbursed. <laughs> He's not complaining. Um, he, he was talking about how he uh, once went bungee jumping. And I was going to say that, you know, I don't think this experience will be as death-defying as that, but I do intend to ask some pretty direct questions. All right. Um, but uh, the other thing that sort of topped that uh, was that he casually mentioned that uh, Vice President Pence almost killed his sons twice. <laughs> so why don't we start there? <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, the uh, vice president used to live in my neighborhood temporarily, and uh, his security detail would come barreling through because when you see flashing lights on a police car, the seas usually part. And my boys were four and five and didn't care that there were police cars with flashing lights. They probably <laughs> were excited to see police cars with flashing lights and ran out into the street, and I heard the screeching of tires, and we go out, and uh, we see my boys with that same look that goofy four- and five-year-old boys have. I didn't do it. <laughs> and uh, the second time was when the uh, vice president was then governor and had been nominated to be vice president. And my boys knew the governor because, uh, well, many of you may not know this, I was uh, Vice President Pence's Surgeon General in Indiana. And so my boys knew him very well, and they would run into his office, and uh, they brought their friends to the state house and come barreling into the office. And uh, he had Secret Service detail, not the state detail. And the Secret Service detail is no joke when they hear a bunch of commotion running towards the newly named vice presidential candidate. So my boys almost got shot by Secret Service. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad that they didn't. Me um, too. Me too. <laughs> on that note, you've had a very interesting um, path. And it, it's taken you through a, a lot of different aspects of, I think, life in America and, and health in America. So I just wanted to give the audience a little, a little bit about your background and ask you to talk about it. So you, you uh, grew up in rural Maryland, and uh, you spent part of the time working on a tobacco farm. So you're familiar with tobacco as a source of livelihood. But you also, um, cigarettes also um, cut short the life of your grandfather who developed lung cancer and died when you were in high school. So you, you have a sense of tobacco as, as, as livelihood and, uh, and also as killer. Um, and you were an excellent student um, and Thank in, you. in high school, <laughs> so I'm told, my sources tell me. Um, and you won, you were awarded full tuition at uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County through a, a program called the Meyerhof um, yes. Scholarship, which was de developed to basically try to diversify uh, uh, the sciences by giving opportunities to study science to African Americans and other underrepresented groups. And then um, your medical education was uh, also a full scholarship by a foundation um, run by Eli Lilly, the pharmaceutical yes. company. So you, you go off to Indiana, um, you have your medical education in, in Indiana, which is uh, known as a, a, a pretty conservative place. And then you go off and you get a master's of public health at, at UC Berkeley, which- It I wasn't think, like Indiana. I think decidedly <laughs> is not known. Um, so I'm just curious um, about how all of those different experiences have, um, it have shaped your view of um, as a health professional and, the, and, and also of government's role in health issues? Well, those lived experiences really have helped me, I think, view problems from other people's vantage points, put myself in other people's shoes. And the best way to bring all that together is to tell a, a quick story about a time when I was in Switzerland and I was given 10 minutes to describe the United States healthcare system. <laughs> <laughs> and the story I told folks was that if you look at Boston, Massachusetts, and Dallas, Texas, they are further apart on key health issues like guns, like universal access to health care, like uh, abortion, like drug policy, than Berlin, Germany, and Paris, France, two places that during the last great world war literally tried to obliterate each other off the planet, are different countries and speak different languages. And so it's really hard to come up with national 
policies for a lot of these complicated issues. It's why I really believe in local control. I think government's role on a federal level is to lift up best practices, to evaluate what's going on out there, and as much as possible to stay out of the way of local innovation. But you mentioned the tobacco fields. You know, it is a big irony that the Surgeon General of the United States has such a complicated history with tobacco. It killed my grandfather who died from lung cancer, but it also paid for the clothes on my back and the food on my table. And so it really helped me understand that we need to be better communicators and that just because something is our priority doesn't mean it's someone else's priority. I loved my grandfather dearly, but I got to tell you, at the time, I wasn't thinking about my work in the tobacco field as contributing to his death 20 years later. I was thinking about making money so I could take my girlfriend to the movies on the weekend. And, and that's, that's folks out there across America. We've got to stop letting health be pitted against other priorities. We've got to help folks understand that you can do both, that you can focus on health and lift up their priorities at the same time. Another really striking aspect of your, of your story um, is that you have a, a younger brother, Philip, who um, has long struggled with drug addiction and is currently in prison. And you've talked about, um, and uh, you, you've said that you believe that, uh, uh, that his substance use started uh, because he had untreated depression and that he started using, I believe, prescription opioids. Um, and I, I, I've seen where you've talked about um, how this has affected your family, mm -hmm. particularly your parents, um, that, for example, your mother has uh, chronic back pain but um, would not basically take pain medication because she was worried that, that your brother might um, uh, either take, the take it himself or, or sell it, and, um, and that, that your parents almost felt kind of like prisoners in their home for a while because they were afraid to leave not knowing whether... They, they wouldn't drive to Indiana to visit me and their grandkids yeah. because they were scared the TV would be gone when they came back, which it was on more than one occasion. So I, I, I'd like to know how this affected you um, and the person that you've, that you've become. Uh, that's a great question. My brother stole money to support his addiction, but the addiction isn't the whole story. It's the culmination of a lifetime of missed opportunities missed opportunities to recognize and diagnose his anxiety and depression, missed opportunities to connect him with care, uh, missed opportunities to intervene when he started self-medicating with substances such as alcohol, tobacco, marijuana, and then one day someone gave him a pill, a pill that like four out of five heroin users came from probably one of your medicine cabinets <coughs> because we know that most heroin users get started with a prescription medication from someone else's medicine cabinet that was left over. And uh, I just, I, I have to think about the fact that if that could happen to a future Surgeon General's brother, if I missed the signs and my family missed the signs, then there's a lot of work we have to do in terms of raising awareness and fighting stigma. And it's why I put out a digital postcard helping America understand how they could respond to the opioid epidemic on SurgeonGeneral.gov. But it's also why I continue to share his story as painful as it is. Uh, stigma's, stigma's one of our biggest killers. And only by sharing these stories can we help lower stigma, help folks see that it can happen to anyone. And you asked about my family. A story that is especially painful for me to tell is when I took my 14 and 12 year old boys to state prison to visit their uncle. I remember driving in the barbed wires across the fences and my boys are asking, why is that there? We go through the, the metal gates, multiple layers of metal gates, watching my 14 and 12 year old boys. Any of you all have kids? Watching my 14 and 12 year old boys go through a metal detector and get essentially strip searched. But I did it because I wanted my boys to understand that their uncle wasn't a bad person, that he had a disease, and that he had a disease for which there's treatment. And I also did it because I wanted my brother to understand that I didn't think he was a bad person, that I still loved him, and that I was not ashamed of him, and I was not going to keep his family 
away from him, especially when he was at his lowest point. And so uh, I think that folks hearing the Surgeon General share that, I mean, you know, it's, it's definitely painful. Uh, I, it paints me in a bad light in some people's eyes, but I found that as I go around the country, more and more people come up to me afterwards and say, you know, me too. That's happened to my family. That's my experience, and I've never had the courage to come forward and share my family's story until I heard you share your story. I think that's part of my role as Surgeon General is to enable people to come forward and to speak out, when they, uh, especially in regards to the opioid epidemic. And what, um, what is your family's experience and your brother's experience? How has that informed um, the, the policy approach that you're taking now to opioids? You mentioned the, the postcards, but you also um, put out uh, uh, a, a report or a statement basically saying, you know, lots of people should be, should be carrying naloxone. Um, pretty much everybody should have it, right? And Absolutely. Uh, I've lived it. Uh, I put out a Surgeon General's Advisory, the first in over a decade, advising folks to know, how, know about and carry naloxone, an opioid overdose reversal agent. Uh, there's a person dying every 11 minutes. Three people will die in the time I'm, I'm up on this stage. Three people across this country from drug overdoses. And uh, over half of them are dying in a home environment. They're dying in a bedroom, in a garage, in a kitchen. And so we need everyone to understand that they have a part to play in the opioid epidemic. And that's why I put out the advisory. And it's why I get so upset when folks are willing to throw a life away, when they're willing to say that I'd rather let someone die than to take a chance on them getting into treatment, but also to take a chance that maybe they'll go out and continue to use again. But it's also why we've got to make sure it's not just about naloxone, that it's about connecting people to care, that it's about fostering a conversation, that it's figuring out how to prevent people from going down this unfortunate pathway in the first place. Our country right now is, is, is reeling from mass shootings, gun massacres in churches, synagogues, schools, nightclubs, dance halls, um, not to mention the, the almost daily uh, occurrence of, of gun violence that doesn't make headlines. And you, as an anesthesiologist, um, you uh, worked in, on trauma surgery uh, for gunshot victims. So I, I'd like to ask, um, I, I have basically sort of a series of, of kind of yes or no questions that, and you can elaborate a little bit later, I guess, but I'd like to try to get you to sort She's of. She's going to use her reporter uh, <laughs> speak on me. Well, I think, you know, that this is an issue that is so consuming America right now, and, and, uh, and, and the American people want to know what their top health officials think about it. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, my first question is, do you agree with the, the legions of, of doctors and, and other health professionals who say that people dying from gun violence is a public health issue? Uh, well, I'd like to give you a yes or no answer to that question. The clear and most honest answer I can give you is whether or not it's a public health issue depends by definition on the community that you're talking about. A public health issue is one where it's affecting everyone in that community. And I'll tell you a story about when I went to Arkansas, a really quick story. I spoke to an individual when I was giving a talk down there, and I said, what are you going to do tomorrow morning? It was a Friday night, and I was getting on a plane. And she said, tomorrow morning, I'm going to go out hunting with my sons. So in her community, access to guns was a way of family bonding and of building resilience. They didn't see gun violence as being a public health issue in that community. But I went to school in Baltimore, and in Baltimore, I can tell you, the presence of guns is absolutely a public health issue, and we need to have the courage to have a more nuanced conversation and not try to apply national labels to problems, particularly when folks, uh, uh, when, it, when it shuts down conversation. And I can tell you, as a gun owner myself, and as someone who knows many doctors who are gun owners, we completely believe in better background checks. We completely believe 
and, uh, and the need to look at protocols and ways that we can improve gun safety for all, but people shut down when you use words like gun control. This country was founded because folks didn't want to be controlled. And so we have to be better communicators, and that starts with, with being better listeners and with recognizing that different people view things differently. We've got to find the common ground. And there's plenty of common ground found there, and that's what I hope to accomplish as Surgeon General, is to try to find that common ground. Let's talk about if you want to own a gun, how can we own it more safely? Let's talk about the suicide rates that are going through the roof and the need to prevent people with mental health issues from getting access to firearms so they can't hurt themselves or other people. And let's stop trying to say you're either pro-gun control or you're pro-letting kids die. So um, are, you, are you an NRA member? I am not an NRA member, okay. and so I will tell you that's another problem that we have is that there are a lot of people out there who think that the NRA speaks for all gun owners, and the reality is that there are a lot of gun owners out there who believe in, in a lot of the things that, that a lot of you all believe in, believe that we can create a safer world and still protect people's rights to own guns. So it sounds like the, the American College of Physicians um, came out with a recent position paper that, that said that uh, it supported uh, strengthening uh, regulation of legal firearms to make it less likely that the most lethal weapons would get into the hands of killers. It sounds like what you're saying is that you agree with that with that statement, right? That you're that that you you'd, you'd support some regulation um, that would that would tighten up loopholes and 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 make it less likely for uh, people who shouldn't have guns to get them. Uh, well, I in case That's you all answer. haven't <laughs> noticed, uh, I try to again make sure I don't accept false premises. And that paper that was put out had more in it than just that statement. And the NRA reacted to I think. They, in, in, in the not, not the best of ways, or at least a spokesperson, to the entirety of the paper at a very inopportune time. But I said this clearly earlier this week, and uh, I will say it again, that it is absolutely within physicians' lanes to talk to their patients about ways that they can be safer, and that includes seat belts, that includes bicycle helmets, and that includes having a discussion about whether or not you have firearms in your home and whether or not you're keeping them safe, particularly if there are other risk factors. I believe that unequivocally. But I believe, again, that when we use words like gun control, when we use language that shuts people down, you're going to see people react and say things that don't facilitate a conversation, don't help us find common ground. Right. Now, I'm not using the word gun control, but I... W but but, but I there, was th right. there were suggestions of gun control right. in that paper. Right. I understand. Um, one more question along those lines. Do you support giving the CDC research money to do research on health issues related to guns? Well, uh, I think that's another place where folks are, are mistaken. Uh, the CDC is doing research on guns. Last week they put out an MMWR talking about how the uh, homicide rates and suicide rates across our country are rising and put out recommendations for communities on ways that they actually could lower violence in their communities. And so there is no ban on the CDC doing surveillance or research. The actual Dickey Amendment says that the CDC cannot do research which will advocate for gun control. Once again, there's that language. And I'm very proud of Dr. Redfield, I'm proud of Secretary Azar, and I'm proud of the work that the CDC is doing to make sure we're doing all we can on a federal level to, uh, to support better research, better surveillance, better interventions to stop violence of all types. The CDC recently reported that uh, the rate of sexually transmitted diseases is at an all-time high. And teenage pregnancy has been going steadily down largely because of uh, long-acting contraception and sex education, um, but it's still an issue. So I'm wondering, and then again, sort of a quick answer, um, whether you support uh, sex education that includes discussion of condoms and contraceptives and safe sex um, to address those issues. Family planning is, is a critically important part of health. It predicts income. It predicts whether or not you're going to engage in other risky behaviors 
down the road. And uh, as a physician, I think that that needs to be an option that's on the table. I think where the controversy comes is in whether or not taxpayer funds will be used to promote certain policies. And that's, that's the push and the pull of policy and politics and in this big, great country we have. As Surgeon General, my job is to try to make sure the science is part of every single discussion. And I'm always going to fight to make sure the science is part of the discussion. But at the end of the day, it's always going to be up to the voters to decide where that balance lies between the science and, and the, their beliefs and what they want to spend their money on and their priorities. You know, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, folks get excited when they hear me say that I'm going to lead with the science, and I will always lead with the science, but the science doesn't always rule the day. The science always ruled the day. You all would have been to bed at 9 o'clock last night. You would have gotten up at 6 o'clock in the morning and joined me in the gym. <laughs> you wouldn't have had more than one cup of coffee today. But the reality is, we all in our lives make decisions that are against the science. My job isn't to force every decision to be made based on the science, it's to make sure the science is part of the discussion. How do you navigate the aspects of this administration that conflict with your experience and your values? And I can think of a couple, I'm sure you can think of more. Just for example, you, you grew up, I'm not sure if you still suffer with asthma, but you, mm -hmm. yeah. And so you obviously know the importance of, of clean, breathable air, and you, you, you're part of an administration that has rolled back clean air regulations. You are one of the few high-ranking African Americans in this administration, and the leader of the administration employs rhetoric and policies on issues like immigration that are seen by many as inflaming racial and ethnic division in this country and are welcomed by people who are white nationalists. When are we going to get to the hard question? <laughs> <laughs> so how do you feel about that? <laughs> well, how I feel about it is, this is similar to how I feel about every relationship I have in my, in my life. I don't always get along with my wife. I don't always get along with my kids. But I'm not going to check out of the relationship and not stay involved and try to steer the relationship in a direction that I think is positive. Uh, the other thing I would say is I've been in state government and I've been in federal government and Despite what you all will believe, I've not met a person who I feel is fundamentally trying to hurt people, who doesn't want to try to improve America. And so you talk about, uh, about, about uh, em the environment. Uh, well, the challenge with the environment is that we want to find a balance between protecting the environment but also protecting people's ability to earn a living. I talked about how I grew up in the tobacco fields when a coal miner who lives in a town where his grandfather and his brother and everyone in his family was able to earn a good living in a coal mine, and then you come along and say, we're going to shut down the coal mine because we want to protect the environment, all they think about is, I can't put food on the table. And so my focus, personally, is on trying to help people find the win-wins. And you can't do that if you're not at the table. I'm convinced there are a lot of win-wins out there. Uh, we try to make everything binary. You're either for or against. It's either yes or no. But the reality is there's a lot of low-hanging fruit out there, and I'm going to stay at the table and try to make sure we find that low-hanging fruit, because if I'm not there, then no one's going to find it. <laughs> so recently, we were talking about this backstage, there, there were four former Surgeon General, Surgeons General, who um, appeared at the New York Academy of Medicine and, um, and they had a panel discussion. And they w all said, um, and this was, I think their terms ran from something like 1990 through 2006, um, and they all said that there were issues that they wanted to speak out about or they wanted to take action on and that they were muzzled by the administrations that they worked for 
Um, and they were all proven right, ultimately. But, they, but it was very difficult for them. So I'm wondering what the issue is or issues are <laughs> it, it, that you would like to that you would like to pursue that you are not um, getting support or or are concerned that the administration might not support. For example, mm -hmm. would you, a, a Surgeon General, make gun safety a priority issue? And if not, why not? So uh, it's a great question. M one of the tenets of my term is trying to help people become more effective communicators. And we can talk about the president and we can talk about the average American. If you look at uh, polls, exit polls from just last week, and they're the same as for the last 20 years, what do people vote on? They vote on jobs and the economy, they vote on safety and security. And so as Surgeon General, what I'm trying to do is help the administration, Congress, and the American people understand that the way to achieve your priorities is through promoting community health and promoting better health. And that's whether you're talking about gun safety or whether you're talking about, about the environment or whether you're talking about drug policy or, or whatever. And so when you ask the question, uh, you, am I muzzled? The reality is anyone who's interested in health has been muzzled for most of their careers because we haven't spoken in a way that resonates with the priorities of folks who are out there. And the Surgeon General, one of our primary jobs, and I know all the former Surgeons General, is to be an effective health advocate. And in order to be a, an effective health advocate, you've got to speak in a voice and a language that resonates with folks. And you saw C. Everett Koop do that. You saw David Satcher do that. You saw the Surgeons General, who we remember as the great ones, uh, really speak in a voice that resonated with folks, and that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I'll also say very honestly that uh, love the president or hate him, he is A, willing to disrupt, and B, not beholden to traditional special interests. So uh, I've actually had a very, uh, a very free reign wi within the, the current uh, term that I've had. I've not had the experience where I've been told you can't speak on this issue because this is a president who, unlike some of our previous surgeons generals, isn't beholden to a lot of those, uh, those, those old groups. And I'll give you a great example, a drug cost. Uh, a lot of folks have been scared to stand up to big pharma. Well, Secretary Azar has been more, uh, more adamant and more outspoken than ever about drug cost and about the administration really going after some of the bad players out there in a way that you've never heard before, and the president has allowed him to do that. And so I'm focused on taking advantage of this opportunity where we are at a time of change and disruption to make sure there's innovation in, the positive, in a positive way. And uh, again, we, need, we can do that by, uh, by more effectively communicating with folks and speaking to their priorities. Okay, I think we have time for one more question and I, I wanna switch back to... Um, Here comes the hard one. <laughs> this will be the, not a hard one, um, but I think one of the things that is really, really admirable is your willingness to talk about your own family and personal um, health issues. And one of them, which you announced, um, I believe in the spring, is that your wife, Lacey has metastatic melanoma and is um, undergoing immunotherapy. So, um, first of all, how, how is she doing? Um, Thank you for asking. She's actually doing very well. We're really blessed to, uh, to have access to, to high quality health care. And I recognize that as a blessing that not everyone has, but she is doing very well. That's good. And your kids are doing okay? My kids are hanging in there. I mean, my boys are, are boys. And uh, they keep it real for dad. They don't care that I'm the Surgeon General uh, at one iota. Uh -huh. I struggle with the same things that everyone else does. I, I don't think my middle son has eaten a full serving of anything green in the last year. <laughs> and uh, I come home and just like every other parent have to fuss at my kids about getting off the screens and, and putting the Fortnite away. But uh, you know, <laughs> but I think that, I think that helps me be a better Surgeon General because I'm not out there saying new guidelines came out and you're a bad parent <laughs> if you can't make your kids comply. I'm going home and struggling just like every other dad is in America trying to get my kids to put the screens down, be active, and, uh, and eat healthy. Okay, that might be a good note to end on. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Adams. Thank you. It's been a really Thank you all. Conversation.